My name is Willie Bolin. I study influence, persuasion, and leadership in selling and sales management, and I teach people how to sell. In this podcast, we'll talk to some of the world's top sales leaders and see what we can learn from them. Welcome to the Sales Lab. This episode of the Sales Lab is brought to you by the 2020 International Collegiate Sales Competition, a sales recruiting event happening November 11th through 14th in sunny Orlando, Florida. Look, we all know that recruiting top talent is a persistent challenge for sales organizations. The mission of the ICSC is to enhance the selling profession by encouraging the development of the critical sales skills needed by today's collegiate sales graduates in a fun and competitive environment and to provide a venue where companies can meet the nation's top collegiate sales talent in one place. This year, the ICSC will be attended by over 500 sales-focused college students from over 90 universities who come to compete in either a sales role-play competition, a sales management case competition, or both. Will your organization be there to hire the best of the best from around the country? Visit www.icsc-fsu.org, that's ICSC as an International Collegiate Sales Competition, Dash FSU, as in Florida State University, dot org, for more information on how you can get involved. Don't let these great recruits go to your competitors. In today's episode of the Sales Lab, we're going to speak with Tommy Herman from Qualtrics. Now, Tommy's a little bit younger than some of our prior guests, but that's okay. He's doing some really interesting things at Qualtrics. Uh, if you are not familiar with Qualtrics, get to learn a little bit more about them. They're an interesting company. They started out doing survey software. Now they're kind of morphing into more of a holistic customer experience and employee experience uh, type of a company. Now, Tommy can tell you all about that. I'll also say he's got uh, a name that's almost as cool as mine. So that's exciting. Big takeaway from this episode is, uh, you know, Tommy's going to tell us about how surprised he was when he got into sales and actually enjoyed it. And of course, this is not a rare experience for those of you that have been around sales hiring for very long. A lot of people are a little reluctant at first to embrace the idea that they're going to be in sales. And then they find out, you know, it's not really about pushing people around or manipulating people or getting people to buy things they don't need. Nobody likes those things, I hope. It's more about solving customer problems, finding solutions, developing things that don't exist, uh, you know, things that people, I think, tend to like. So this is a good episode. It's going to be part one of a two-part series where we're conversing with Tommy. Hope you enjoy it. Thanks. All right. We're here with Tommy Herman from Qualtrics. You know, as a professor, I think just about all professors use Qualtrics. So, you know, I guess I'm pretty familiar with your product. Yeah. Uh, What is your formal title? So I'm a, a senior uh, team lead for the SDR department. So SDR senior team lead. SDR being sales development representative. Okay. So you have a team. How big's your team? I've got 15 on my team now. Uh, that's fluctuated over the years, but um, yeah, usually anywhere from, from 12 to 18 or so. We have a two pizza rule. If you you can't feed your team with less than two pizzas, and your team's too big. Interesting. So we, we try to keep it uh, about about 12 12 to 14 is probably ideal. Okay. And uh, obviously we're here to talk about sales and sales yep. leadership. So I kind of like to start with the question of, you know, let's define our constructs, right? What, what do you, what does selling mean to you? How would you define selling? Yeah. So it, it, Qualtrics, I've been there six years and our, our mindset of, of sales, our methodology <clears throat> hasn't really changed over the years, but our maybe approach uh, has a little bit. So we, we define selling. It really is, is consultative, right? I think a lot of people have a misnomer on, on what B2B sales is, particularly in the SaaS space or the tech space, which obviously is where where Qualtrics is at. So I I define sales as a a kind of a a 4-3-2-1 model. So I would say that that, uh, sales, you know, 40% 40 is is sales. And when I say that, a lot of people still don't know what it is, but I would say 40% of sales, 30%, you know, marketing, 20% networking, and 10% administrative is the the 4-3-2-1 model that I would say is is, is what sales is to, to me and to us at Qualtrics, but really taking a consultative approach where it's not just you know, dialing for dollars and blowing through cold calls. It's really understanding a, a company before we ever pick up the phone, understanding what department I'm going to be calling into, what is the potential value or the ROI that I could see for a product like Qualtrics. So we typically go after, um, you know, marketing as a really easy group to, to target first. But before I ever pick up the phone, understanding what's the, the account map look like, what are the potential values that I could see and trying to understand what that specific department, individual or company might be facing where we could add some value. So very consultative going in and, and you know, instead of saying, here's this great product, let me push it down your throat. It's it's uh, obviously a lot of discovery. Hey, help me understand your role. 
what are some, some of the challenges that you're facing? And, and based on that conversation here uh, or here not is where I see us having an impact. So, um, no, that's great. I mean, it sounds very targeted, right? You're not just yeah. picking up the yellow pages and, yeah. uh, and, and guessing. So what type of research do you do before you start reaching out to a company? So uh, we uh, we use I'm sure like a lot of companies uh, sales navigator LinkedIn sales navigator so part of it is is um, you know understanding the accounts that we're going to target so we are regionalized at Qualtrics we're not verticalized in a, in a given industry but we are regionalized based on uh, on zip code essentially so our guys might be selling into some kind of a merchandising company on one call and the very next call they're working with hospitality right or food and beverage so we're not verticalized in that sense but uh, there are reps who who almost self verticalized in the sense that I, I'm more comfortable having a hospitality conversation or I'm more comfortable uh, with, uh, with B2B manufacturing or whatever. So they can kind of pick and choose the companies to go after. The benefit of that is, is you get really good in a given industry. So back when I was an account executive, I got really good in the ad space, calling advertising agencies because I, I studied that in school, kind of understood it. I had a lot in, in my given territory. So I was able to get really good at understanding the, the verbiage and the pain points and the needs in that space. And uh, so, but, you know, before I get on the phone, it's, it's a first and foremost to understand what, what the company is. I remember <laughs> my very first cold call at Qualtrics six years ago, I picked up the phone. I had my mentor sitting there with me. I called him up and uh, it turned out to be the wrong company. I had dialed the wrong number and pivoted pretty quickly. I said, well, what do you guys do? What do you need? What are your business pain points? Right. And, and was, it was actually wildly enough able to, <laughs> to set up an initial discovery call. They ended up not purchasing with us, but it, it goes to show the, the importance of, of having that research ahead of time. So I like to understand what does the company do first and foremost, which believe it or not, there's a lot of people, at least in the space that we, we call into. Sometimes it's hard to understand what a business does. Mm-hmm. You get on their website and it's like, okay, IT, technical support, like what, what exactly is their business model? How do they make money? Right. If I don't understand how they make money, how in the world am I going to add value to, to well, any that, kind of a yeah, business? Yeah, that set of words could be used to describe about a thousand Anything, different yeah. specific business forms, yeah. right? So that that is what comes to mind first and foremost is understanding what does the company do? What do they care about? Right, That's what Qualtrics does. We help them um, you know, mitigate risks, increase revenue, and decrease costs. But those are so broad. That could be any, any number of things. Um, so what does the company do? The individual that I'm calling what do they do? We have a uh, what we call a three by three. So in three minutes before I ever pick up the phone, I want to find three things, three pieces of information on three categories. So either about the individual, about their department, or about the company. So three for each of those? Yep. Or, okay, yep. perfect. In three minutes or less. If I can't find it in three minutes, I just need to pick up the phone, call the front desk, and say, hey, I'm trying to get a hold of somebody who's over your customer experience. Who, who might that be? So a lot of times, especially young junior SDRs that I work with, they they want to make less phone calls and spend more time doing research. Oh, if I could make less phone calls and focus on research, I'd have way better calls. It's like, yeah. yeah at to, some point, you got to grab that phone and exactly. just uh, to an extent, let it fly. Yeah. Sure. But uh, yeah, in our experience, if, if within three or five minutes, you can't find enough valid information, just pick up the phone, call the front desk, say, here's, who, here's a conversation I want to have. Who might you point me to? And, uh, and then you just do it on the phone. You know, I'm realizing I, I would hate to take for granted that somebody listening to this knows exactly what Qualtrics does because you guys are a fairly uh, unique company out there. Yeah. So uh, give us give us the overview of what types of solutions or offerings would you be uh, you know putting in front of a customer? Yeah, so so we uh, we've kind of self branded ourselves as an experience management software. Um, experience management is, is a relatively new term. Um, a quick background on Qualtrics. So we started in 2002 as a, a, a market research uh, academic survey software. Right, It was created by a professor at Brigham Young University out in Utah. And um, his idea was to have a, a simple yet sophisticated research academic research software. There was a lot of products out there, but in his mind, nothing that was simple and sophisticated enough at the same time, which, which was tough to do. So, yeah, so um, I'm a, I'm a professor. My, one of my responsibilities is to do research. So I want to survey a bunch of salespeople yep. or accountants or, you know, whatever field yep. I'm in or customers. And, uh, having done some of those in paper, uh, it's really terrible to do on yeah. paper. And then you've got to convert it into an Excel sheet or do, yep. you know, you have to have some way to get the data into a spreadsheet. And uh, so what that would look like is, okay, now I can use Qualtrics. It's an online survey. The data exports into Excel automatically, and I'm ready to analyze in a matter of minutes mm-hmm. rather than spending a month in yeah, data. Days or weeks. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I mean, it, it's, uh, you know, you can export into, into Excel, SPSS. We do have native reporting within Qualtrics, which over the years has gotten a lot more robust. But that was the idea that there was, there was a lot of freemium, quick and dirty survey softwares out there and a lot of really high-end expensive softwares. And so what Qualtrics aimed to do initially was be that middle ground where it was sophisticated yet simple. Our old tagline when I first started was, 
you know, sophisticated research made simple. It's sophisticated enough for a PhD, yet easy enough for an intern. Uh, we've, we've obviously over the years evolved and matured out of that. Now, we're not just surveys. We, we aim to help companies manage the four core experiences of any business, and not just companies, but any organization, right? So everything from the Microsofts and Apples of the world down to mom and pop startups to the federal government, um, K-12 school districts, nonprofit agencies, churches. I mean, any organization out there can, can uh, that they care about gathering data in some form or fashion. And it's usually around four domains or four areas. So what we call CX or customer experience, those are things like customer satisfaction, NPS or net promoter scores, uh, likelihood to repurchase, shopping cart abandonment through e-commerce sites, you know, anything regarding uh, the, the, a touch point in a customer life cycle. Second is employee experience or EX, and that's anything in an employee life cycle, right? Everything from pre-hire assessments to onboarding, uh, to feedback on trainings, to employee engagement, pulse surveys, uh, likelihood to attrits, uh, value drivers of what, what key indicators ahead of time can we start to see in a customer or in an employee life cycle that makes them at a higher risk of attrition. So trying to intercept those, those situations quicker on. Um, and then the last two are, are brand experience and product experience. So any, you know, brand experience being anything around brand equity tracking studies. Um, you think of a lot of some of our really big clients and, and groups where their brand is their product. You think of a group like a, like an Apple or a Nike, right? When I go buy a pair of shoes, like, like, yeah, Nike pr- puts out good shoes, but I'm buying that swoosh. Right, like I'm buying that Apple logo on my phone. That that's really what what their product is, is their brand. And so helping companies better manage that brand equity and, and helping them understand what is going to resonate well in uh, in a market. You know, what kind of you know with product experience, what kind of brands are going to going to land well. We do a lot of conjoint analysis, A/B testing before a products ever taken to market. So really, any data in or out of a company regarding customers, employees, product, or brand. Uh, yes, survey based, right? But we're no longer just a survey software. We're really a true experience management uh, company. And that, that term, our belief is that 5, 10, 15 years from now, just like we have sales classes and marketing classes in, in universities across the country, we truly believe there's going to be experience management classes, right? Like we, we think this is a new industry uh, that has just grown, you know, just in the past year since we've really kind of carved it out. There, you know, it's, it's a, you know, $21 billion space. There's all sorts of companies trying to get a piece of the pie. It's this, this industry that we've created and uh, there's such a need out there. If you look at, at, at what the world is, 10, 15 years ago, it was enough to have the best product or the cheapest product, right? But today, and really it's millennials, people my age that, that are kind of driving this change, is that we're the first generation in history that would rather spend our money on experiences rather than, than things, right? Mm. And so we call that an experience economy. There's, there's been this drastic shift away from what's the best or the cheapest product to, hey, who provides the best experience? And uh, uh, Great book by the way, yeah. Landon Gilmore, Experience Economy. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So it's uh, it's a real thing, and it's exciting to uh, to be really kind of on the forefront and, and a part of that. You know, you're you're fairly fresh into your career. Yep. Tell me how you got into your current role. You started in a sales position, or mm-hmm. how did you get where you are? Yeah, so quick personal story. So I'm from Seattle. I went to school in Utah at BYU where Qualtrics was founded, which is how I, I learned of, of the name and kind of got involved there. Oddly enough, I never wanted to be in sales. I think that, that's uh, fairly common for a lot of salespeople today. Uh, my, my concept of sales was the used car salesman, the door-to-door insurance sales guy. I got a lot of buddies that made a lot of money doing that kind of sales in college, but it wasn't something I wanted to, to have as a career. And uh, my degree was actually in broadcast journalism, of all things. And I uh, really enjoyed studying that, but realized pretty quick that probably wasn't a super family-friendly uh, career. I'm married with kids, and so I wanted something that uh, provided a little bit uh, higher pay and, and better work-life balance. And so uh, when I graduated, I applied at a lot of different companies. Coming from Seattle, I applied to a lot of the big tech firms up there, Microsoft, Amazon, uh, Nintendo, some other outfits, and was lucky enough to, to have a, a couple of offers, one of which I accepted. But my wife had a semester left of school in Utah when I graduated. And so a buddy of mine who was one of the first engineers at Qualtrics said, hey, we're hiring in sales. You'd be great at it. And I was like, sales? No way, man. I don't (laughs) want anything to do with that. I was mostly applying for uh, client success or operational type roles at at some of these other firms in in the Northwest. And anyways, my mindset was, you know, Qualtrics, I've heard the name, surveys, don't know much else about it. This was back when we had maybe 70 or 80 employees. It was six years ago. And it was a very different company than we are today. And um, so my mindset was, that'll ah, be fun to work at a startup before I go get a, a big boy job. A real job was, was kind of the thought that I had. And so I, <laughs> Wait, I got, so at the time there were 70 or 80 employees. Uh, you, uh, you guys have a lot more than that now. Yeah. How, how many do you Yeah. Have? So we're up to 1700 worldwide. Uh, we have 12 offices. We're a truly global organization valued at $2.7 billion. Okay, and that's pretty remarkable growth. We're talking it's, six years. That's, that's kind of amazing. Yeah. We've, I mean, we've really had nearly 50% year over year growth every year that I've been there. Uh, both an employee headcount as well as revenue. And, and it's just, 
it's been such a wild ride. I mean, when I started there, it, we were kind of a, a nothing company just out of Provo, Utah, you know, just, just south of Salt Lake City. And um, with the shift in the market, you know, it's a little bit of right time, right place, but also obviously incredible um, intellectual people that we have at the company and, and, and same leadership just from a, an ability to, to have a vision and go execute on that vision. And so it, it's been quite the ride. And yeah, we're the growth that we've seen is probably the number one reason I've, I've stayed, stayed there. It's, it's really exciting to be a part of that. Um, but yeah, when I started, that was not the case. It, it, I remember walking in and, you know, there was ceiling tiles falling out of the ceiling. There was cords running across the ground. It, it was very much a startup. And I was like, where in the world am I? I remember calling my mom saying, Hey, I got this job at Qualtrics. And she was like, what the heck is that? Like, what are you, what are you doing? Right. And, uh, anyway, so I told my buddy I was interested. I went through, um, believe it or not, 13 or 14 interviews, met with all the founders and, and was lucky enough to be given an offer to be an account executive. I had really no previous sales experience. I, I did a little bit of sales in college with a, a kind of a multi-level marketing company also based out of Utah where I, I worked with Latin America to place orders and uh, handle shipments and stuff of beauty products uh, of all things. And so I did a little bit of sales, but really not not much exposure to it. And uh, my full intent was to be on in six months. I said, hey, look, I, I need a paycheck for six months and then we're moving to Seattle. Mm. Like that was a done deal. And uh, obviously, I'm not an idiot, so I didn't say that in the interview. I, I just, you know, kind of went through it the best I could. And I remember uh, Dan Watkins, who now is our, our kind of head of North American Sales at the time, he made me the offer and sent me. He said, Tommy, I want to make you an offer uh, to come be an account executive at Qualtrics. He said, but I want you to look me in the eye and commit to me for two years. So there was something through my interview process that came out where... Some kind of red flag. Yeah, yeah. where he, he kind of <laughs> said, he zeroed in on that. And I'm not an idiot, so I said, oh, yeah, you know, if things go great, there's no reason I why I might not be here in, in five years, you know, in back of my mind, I'm like, no, I'm, you know, I'm gone in December. And, and I was really, really blown away uh, at, at the time, unpleasantly surprised at how much I, I loved it. Lo- loved sales, loved Qualtrics, our product, the leadership team that we had. I think our, our early leaders did a really good job on helping us kind of drink the Kool-Aid. And I just got out of a couple of interviews with candidates here and, and, you know, was saying, yeah, sales is great. Our product's great. But the reason that, that I'm in sales at Qualtrics is because I really believe in, in the company, the product, the difference that we're making, and and really the upward mobility of what this company can be. It's really exciting to be on a rocket ship and know that, that we've had that insane growth from 80 to 1,700 employees in, in less than six years um, to be valued at $2.7 billion in, in, a, in an industry that's really, we just kind of created out of thin air. It yep. is, is a pretty unique experience. Wow. So you start in sales. You said it was unpleasantly surprising. Why? Why? Why do you, those are very specific words to choose? Why those yeah, words? Yeah. So as I mentioned, I, I never wanted to be in sales. I kind of had this preconceived idea of, of I didn't want to go home at Christmas and tell my grandmother that I'm in sales, you know, and here I'm slinging software all across the country. And um, again, I, I think like a lot of people today, I, I had that that misnomer of of what sales was. When I got into Qualtrics, I really started to understand it. You know, it's it's not the used car guy. It's not the summer sales guy. It's, it's really consulting. Right. And that was one area that I was interested in. I, I wanted to work with companies. I wanted to strategize. And, uh, one of the, one of the majors I didn't go into, but heavily looked at was uh, business strategy at, at the university I was at and, um, really, really kind of considered that. That was all, it had always been interesting to me. So when I got into the, you know, past the initial knee jerk reaction of, Oh, I got to make cold calls and oh, I got to do objection handling. Right. When I, once I got on the phone with clients and started to understand, the impact we could have is when it really clicked. And I was like, this is really cool, right? I, I can go into a company and with a product that I've got full faith and belief in that it's going to make a pretty big impact in their business. Again, whether it's mitigating their risks, increasing costs or, or sorry, reducing costs or increasing revenue. Again, those are all three very big buckets, but that's what we do. We aim to help companies manage their experiences and do one of those three things. And so it's, it's a lot of strategizing. It's a lot of consulting and not every sales job is like that. I get it. But but for us at Qualtrics, when, when I finally realized that probably about three or four months in, uh, when I had a couple of at-bats and saw some deals close, it was um, when I would say I was unpleasantly surprised because it was just a drastic change from what I had planned on. I never yeah. intended that to, to be the case. And uh, six short years later, I'm still there. There you go. So you're an account executive for about how long? Uh, about a year and a half, a little over a year and a half. And uh you know, had, had kind of you know made the decision. I, I've been involved in leadership roles my entire life, whether it be through school or church or in the community or whatever else. And so I, um, I really thrive off of working with other people. I get a lot of genuine satisfaction out of seeing somebody succeed. Some of my favorite stories are taking an underperformer, putting a, some kind of a success plan in place, a real hard metric plan, and, and working towards that and seeing them get promoted at the end of it is is really satisfying. Not for the sake of, you know, I'm I'm the boss and that's me, but but genuinely I enjoy seeing people succeed and get what they do. 
you know, what they deserve. So after about 18 months, I, I kind of popped my head up and looked elsewhere and said, hey, I, you know, I, I enjoy sales, but I, I'm not getting the day-to-day -day satisfaction out of uh, what I had kind of envisioned my career to be. And so I was literally looking for a hybrid role, which uh, just so happened on, uh, to be the case through the sales development program. It didn't exist when I started. Everybody was hired into a direct account executive role. And you kind of worked up through the ranks. And when, once you were in sales, you're in sales. It was pretty hard to move uh, laterally at Qualtrics. And really when I started, it was two departments. Engineers built product, sales sold product. I mean, mm -hmm. there was no marketing. There was no client success. There was no HR. There was no legal. I mean, it, it was it was pretty uh, a pretty skeleton operation. And so as we evolved over that first year, year and a half, new departments popped up. We had a marketing department. Uh, client success was this new idea that, that we had. And so I started expressing interest in, you know, still being in the sales world, but being in a, in a position where I could... I uh, felt like I had a little bit more impact internally as, as opposed to externally with clients. And so um, this idea came along of a sales development program, and I was one of the first uh, first hired onto that team and uh, was put into a team lead position as, as an SDR you know, team lead. And then I've been there for the past four and a half years. So I don't personally sell. I'm not on the front lines uh, as often these days. On occasion, I still jump on phone, phone calls, and I like to sharpen my axe and kind of keep that skill set fresh because a lot of our program is preparing guys and, and gals to go be account executives. It's about a two-year training program. And uh, so I got to keep that skill set up. But day-to-day, -day, it's it's a little bit less with clients and more so focus internally on uh, talent development, coaching, and preparing people to move into a successful AE path. So t tell me a little bit about that program. What uh, you know? How does that roll out? Yeah, so we call it sales development, business development, account development. People have different names for it. It's all, all kind of the same stuff in my book. Uh, we started out as opportunity development, and we uh, we just rebranded a couple of years ago as sales development to better uh, fit the market. Some candidates were confused on what opdev or opportunity development was. They thought it was more of an engineering type role, and so we kind of rebranded. Yeah, it does. <laughs> opdev, yeah, right. Sounds a little bit more technical. And we've iterated a lot. When we first started out, it really was just kind of a boot camp training for a month or two. Come in, learn our product. Our product is on the client side. It's very simple, point and click interface, drag and drop, easy to use. Uh, as, as you're probably familiar with it, but um, from a sell side, we have to know obviously the product inside and out, and it, it's a fairly complex product as far as all the use cases and applications that we have. So they'd go through a boot camp of learning products, a uh, real crash course on sales. Here's how you call, here's our, our elevator pitch, here's how you do objection handling. And we've evolved over, over the years after that, we moved into more of a kind of a six to nine month path, right? Where you'd come into an SDR role and after hitting certain KPIs or metrics, you would then be promoted into an account executive role. And then most recently, uh, just as early as January of this year, a couple months ago, we moved to a new uh, long-term path of a two-year program. Wow. So anywhere from 21 months up to three years, again, based on performance, uh, you know, we hire heavily out of colleges, right out of university or people that have less than a year or two experience in sales. They come into our program and it's, um, the, the main purpose we exist is really to, to be a farm club for sales. I know a lot of companies use their BDRs or SDRs as as a supplement to their account executives. So some AEs even, they, they never make cold calls. They just get meetings set for them. You know, it's really kind of the, the hunter closer mentality or mm -hmm. um, gather and closer mentality. And, and that's not our mindset. Yes, we help account executives uh, set up meetings for them and help fill their pipeline, but they're expected to do a lot more than what they're getting from SDRs. So it's really just kind of additive on top of what they're already doing. If, if an AE is banking on their SDR to hit quota, uh, they're probably not going to hit quota, right? It, they they got to depend on themselves and anything they get from our team should be additive to their pipeline. So the real purpose is is uh, is that. It's, it's kind of to, to be a training program, a farm club for sales. And uh, we've learned, uh, you know, to be frank with you, kind of through trial and error and, and some mistakes that we made that six months was not long enough. Right. I, I've personally promoted over 300 AEs uh, to an account executive role at Qualtrics, and sadly, there's there's probably less than 30 that are still at our company, right? Because there was a big discrepancy or gap between hitting metrics as an SDR and being prepared to be an account executive. And it took us uh, several times uh, and iterations to figure that out, and so we're trying to close that gap as far as uh, what does it take to be successful as an SDR and what does it take to be successful as an account executive? On the surface, it seems like it should be pretty similar, but as we've built out this program, and, and I mean completely, we scrapped and rebuilt three times from scratch, right? Everything from compensation to what is our structure, our leadership ratio look like, what, what game do we play? Are we a pipe factory or are we a talent factory, right? So kind of th those things are very contradictory to each other in a lot of ways. And so now we feel like we've settled on a good model to be seen, right? Like I said, we're, we're still pretty fresh on it, but we feel like that two-year model makes a lot of sense. And there's three levels. You're not just a, you're not cold calling for three, for two years, right? You come in and 
you know, the first nine months or so, it's it's entry level sales. A lot of cold calls, a lot of uh, training on how do you how do you handle objections, how do you how do you pinpoint a, a pain in a company and see connect that to the value or ROI that we can provide. Uh, but a lot of it is setting and throwing a meeting over the fence to a senior account executive. After nine months or so, you move into an SD two position. At that level, you get you know SD one, you get maybe twenty percent of the sales funnel or sales cycle. SD2, you get maybe another 25, 30% more where you're actually running the initial qualifying meetings, the needs audit, the qualification. We use Medic. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, that qualification technique, but um, it's a really in-depth look at, at what you know. What are the metrics they care about? What are the pain points? What's the value add that we can provide? Um, actually doing product demonstrations at that point, kind of walking them through our software. And then again, after another six or nine months of any metrics and certain KPIs, you would be promoted into an SD3 level, at which point you run the full cycle. So they're not they're not carrying quota in the sense of our company is banking on them hitting quota for us to hit our overall number, but they'll probably get a subset of a certain territory book of business, right? So instead of carrying a, an AE one seventy five thousand dollar quarterly quarter, uh, quarterly quota, they might have a, a five or ten or fifteen k quarterly quota. That's a subset that rolls up to another region. So the idea is that before we ever put somebody on the sales floor they actually closed deals. And that was the biggest gap that we saw. Our guys got really dang good at cold calling, really good at, at pitching Qualtrics, really good at setting up initial meetings, but that doesn't directly correlate into closed revenue, right? There's a lot of steps yeah. in between there. So those are some of the pivots that, uh, that we've made. Well, that's quite different, <clears throat> certainly historically and, and kind of a, a surprising number of companies still today take this learning on the fly approach to sales, which always kind of cracks me up because you know, they want to spend a lot of time on the features and benefits and product details as if those are too complicated, you know, like a, like a person isn't going to be able to memorize the, the list of these bullet points, you yep. know, that's too hard for them, but it's, it's going to be really easy for them to learn how to navigate complex social uh, situations yep. with long buying cycles and multiple buying influences. And, you know, so it seems obvious that you guys are taking a very different approach to that, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you're deliberately keeping them out of the field, mm-hmm. which I, I think there's quite a few sales organizations that would say, wow, that's crazy. That's no, they, they have to learn in the field. So what, what would you say to them? Yeah, so, so I would just point at our history and kind of experiences of, of successes and failures we've seen. And, and yeah, that, that was our model, right? When I started six years ago, I was a kid coming out of college with no, uh, no real sales experience. And I think the mindset honestly, of our leadership team was like, look, we were growing like crazy. We have a great product. It's selling like crazy. And we have an endless talent pool through through the universities in Utah, right? So we're based in Provo, but they, we hired heavily out of, out of Brigham Young University, University of Utah, uh, Utah State, Utah Valley University. There's a lot of colleges right there close. And we're like, look, Every, every semester, every four months, we have a whole fresh pot of kids coming out of school that are looking for a great job at a, at, a, at a hot tech company, right? And so the mindset was, let's hire. You know, we have a really high bar. We actually hire less than 5% of all applicants at Qualtrics. But the idea was, let's, let's set a really high bar, hire as many as we can, and the best ones are going to stick, right? That was kind of the mindset. I, for example, I started with 16 people in my hire group, and there's two of us today left at Qualtrics, and the other guy is not in sales anymore, right? And so that goes to show that we just... We had a lot of attrition, a lot of churn in the early years, and I think that the company was okay with it at that point. As companies mature, obviously there's different different needs, different budgets, exactly. Find their processes, yeah. yeah. And so I think that was just part of our learning process, and <clears throat> and sadly, yeah, we, we've I think we've we're pretty good at identifying talent, and so even in the early days when somebody did uh, you know show some some exceptional ability, I, I think they did get doubled down on as far as training and resources and whatnot. Uh, but as a, as a tech startup, we were super scrappy, right? Like we didn't blow money. We had we had old school desks and old computers, and um, it very much was a startup underdog mentality. And I think now you look at us as a two point seven billion dollar company, still pre IPO, right? We're we're super excited about going public someday, uh, hopefully soon. But uh, we're a drastically different company today, and we got there by. Uh, what our CEO Ryan Smith calls bootstrapping, right? By not taking on VC money and you know being being highly strategic and highly thoughtful with every bet, and every investment that we we're able to make. And so, uh, so my response to that would be like, yeah, that that's uh, a great way to learn. I uh, I, I uh, learned to speak Spanish and, and I went and lived in Spain for two years. And, and the best way to learn a language is to go and uh, immerse yourself in the language and the culture. I think sales is the same. The best way to learn is go immerse yourself in that. But at Qualtrics, what we found is, is a good hybrid approach with a way that we can still immerse people in that that language of sales, if you will, sitting in on calls, right? One of our one of the main KPIs that we have, aside from calls and number of opportunities they're generating and pipeline they're generating is, is they have to go sit down at least uh, shadow three meetings per week with senior account executives. Right? Those could be col- uh, could be an initial discovery call. It could be a product demonstration. It could be a contract negotiation. So a big part of it is just you're still 
in that world. You're still seeing sales. You're still seeing deals get closed, but you're not, you don't have that, that anchor around your neck of, Hey, you've got a $75,000 quota. If you miss that twice, you're gone. Right. So we've created this environment. That's a little bit more of an incubator, a little bit safer environment. Like, yeah, we got metrics. We got KPIs. We got to go hit. If you don't hit those, there's repercussions and consequences for that, but it's a lower barrier of entry. It's a really shallow beach to kind of, kind of walk into. And, yeah. and we've, uh, it's a, it's a big gamble that has taken a lot of money, a lot of investment from the company, but it's, it's great to have uh, the backing of our leadership team that, that believe that that's going to work. And uh, we uh, we're running hundred percent on that. But again, it's, uh, like I said, we've iterated severely three or four times and, and I would, some people would call those failures, right? Okay, you guys failed three or four times and let's see if this new model now works out, but we've gotten better each time. And I think that's just the natural progression of, of really, whether it's, you know, business or personal skill set you're working on or whatever. Uh, we have a, a mindset of Qualtrics. He fell hard, he fell often. That's how you learn how you get better as long as you, you don't make the same mistake twice. We're going to stop it right there for now. Please dive into the next episode of the Sales Lab to hear the conclusion of this interview. By the way, if you like what you've heard so far, be sure to subscribe and rate the podcast on whatever app you use to listen. Also, share this with your colleagues and friends, and let's continue to have a deeper discussion on all things related to selling and sales leadership. See you next time in the Sales Lab.